Can everyone hear me now? Okay, cool. So um, I was thinking about, you know, I'm presenting about kind of about my own experience in growing a family farm business, but I'm also going to mix in um, some of my professional um, career type stuff because we are the agency that helps people with um, conservation planning. Our motto is help the people help the land. And um, so we have the nine steps of planning where we go through, we'll come out um, to your farm and take a look at, or, or your land, if it's a, you know, it could be a forestry project. And I always think that's really the most important part is being a good listener and listening to the landowner or the, or the entity that you're working with um, to find out what they're really, what they're, goals are for that land and what they'd like to do and that's also equally important for you starting your own business you know i think it's really important to um think down the road um years down the road what would you like to see you know and it's not going to happen overnight but if you have good planning to start with it can really um accelerate your success i think down the road and so you know, I like to write things down and try to figure out um, where we're heading and what direction we're heading. And, and I think that's the key to, um, you know, to success a lot of times. So we can move on to the next one. You should have control over it. So you should hit the arrows or click on it and it should advance. Okay, I thought, okay, good. Thank you. So um, we started, well, I mean, I've been doing farming and all that for years, like I was saying with my grandmother, even when I was a kid, my mom and dad, and, you know, learning all those, um, all those different techniques, I guess, and kind of like traditional ecological knowledge in a way, you know, passing down from generation to generation, all those things that we sometimes take for granted, but a lot of times it really is science. You know, when I, when I started college and I started studying natural resource management and ecology, I really realized that my grandmother was an ecologist. You know, she, Native Americans were the first ecologists and scientists on this continent. They knew, you know, when to plant their gardens and how to do the three sisters and the and all those different things and, and also that spiritual connection to it also and uh, um, you know nowadays we're talking about healthy soils and what type of techniques can we do to build healthy soils those are the old techniques that native americans have always used you know by planting companion plants and cover crops and all those different things um, i think there was a real there's an evolution back to that mindset I think we went way off, you know, and all these synthetic fertilizers and herbicides and Roundup Ready, everything. And now, now I think there's a there's a full circle coming back to um, realizing how important it is to maintain healthy soil with few few inputs because the more you disturb that soil, the more you um, basically injure it, you know. So. I try to do as much no-till and as much cover crop as I can. And I think that when I think back to um, my grandma's little garden and how she, well, it wasn't really that little, but how she, you know, planted all those different companion crops. And at certain times of the year, she'd have um, stuff that would ripen up all throughout the season. She wouldn't plant all of her corn one day, you know, like some people do now. Uh, she'd always have stuff that was getting ready throughout the year and you know all those those farm animals she, she'd mix that into the soil build the soil and the compost put everything back into it again and you know those are the things that were that when I go to to work to these soil health things I mean there are already things that 
that's the way she was doing it back then, you know. So I find that pretty interesting. Um, um, one of our one of our program um, opportunities with NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Services, our high tunnel program. And it really helps extend your growing season is what it does. And it also helps with some disease problems that like, like with especially tomatoes and different things, like if you have too much moisture or um, mildew and different things in the natural setting, you can really control that with the high tunnel. So it, there's a lot of benefits to it. And if anyone's interested, they could look me up and I could I could help them out with an application process for that. Um, and, and they don't have to be real big. This one here is 30 by 70, which is, you know, pretty good sized. Um, but you could scale that back to maybe even half that size if you didn't, if you didn't want to grow, you know, have one that big. Um, putting them up is a little bit of a daunting task if you have never done it. Um, but there are a lot of good, there's a lot of good information out there and we can help walk you through it too. Um, there's quite a few on the reservation that um, were applied for through NRCS and then I think some that came through other grants too, but anyone that personally would like to get one, just um, I'll pass on my contact information. I can help, help them out with that. Um, like I was talking about earlier with the healthy soil, um, I think that's the key to success with, um, with our farm. We were, we were, we were fortunate enough to, um, be able to start growing our vegetables right away organically just because of, um, my, my grandmother and my uncle. And all of them had built up the soil from having cattle and, and other animals, chickens and hogs and everything else on the farm. And then also, um, you know, they didn't really, they, they grazed a lot of the land. So when you graze the land, you're putting the, the biomass back into the soil. Whereas if you're haying and you're just taking the biomass off your land, you're kind of depleting the the soil and the productivity over a long period of time that can have a big impact. It takes a long time to, to really build soil up um, to have all those uh, little ecosystems intact and going. And I, I like to keep as, as low impact on the soil as possible. So um, we, do, we do use a chicken tractor and we kind of rotate that around. What a chicken tractor is, is like a, a portable pin that you can move around. And uh, so the chickens eat up all the clover or whatever's, in, whatever's under there in that pin. And then we supplement, feed them with some uh, organic feed, but we'll move it every couple days, depending on how they eat it. And it's like a rotational thing and we'll just keep rotating it around. And then the following year, we'll plant our garden there, and uh, we don't need to add any kind of fertilizer whatsoever. And we have, you know, just, I mean, look at the size of some of those vegetables. Um, uh, we have a couple questions about high tunnels. All right. On it. Um, so Chuck was wondering, how long did the tunnel extend your season? Oh, it extended my season probably a good month on both ends, I would say. I remember picking tomatoes in there um, and it was like in November and there were still ripe tomatoes in there. So sometimes what I'll do is, you know, just to keep some good salad tomatoes and different things, the tomatillas are usually later. So I'll even cover them inside of the high tunnel with a little tarp if it's gonna get real cold, you know, like super cold, like in October or something or, November and usually I can extend the you know they'll still be in there to pick until I remember even almost I mean it was almost the end of November and I was still eating tomatoes out of there so and then you can start your stuff a lot earlier too um, so yeah it extends it on both ends and then some people also will use it as like a um, like to have their chickens in in the winter 
so they can get around in there and scratch up the soil and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, I, I there's lots of different ways to, to water in a high tunnel as well. Um, but I do recommend like something that's in the ground because you don't want a lot of moisture in there, like above the soil because it can actually build up humidity inside of there. Most of the time, I honestly keep mine open a lot in the summer, you know, because most plants don't like it super hot. Like tomatoes don't like it. They don't want to be over like 80 or 90. If you keep your thing shut down, it'll actually, um, you know, it could kill your plants in just a short time. So that's one thing you want to be aware of is making sure that you're, you're monitoring the temperatures and the temperatures are right for your plants, you know. And then one other thing I brought up to um, that work there a couple of times was like, I noticed a lot of pollinator um, species getting trapped inside the high tunnel. So I, was, so I promote having vents on the ends um, so that the, the butterflies or bees or anything that go in there can escape out of the ends. Otherwise it can kind of serve as almost like a trap for pollinators. I was a little, um, appalled when I went out there and found a bunch of dead pollinators in mine. So I opened up both ends and now I just haven't had as much problem with that. Are there any other questions about that, those? Yeah, do you have any uh, supplemental heating? Do you heat your high tunnel? Um, I don't, but some people do. Um, there's all kinds of ideas. Um, I met this one guy, he was pumping the air from inside the high tunnel under the soil. He had an intricate system of tubing under there. Some people have a wood stove that they hook up in there and you can actually build your end walls out of wood, especially if you have one that's not gonna really affect the sun that much. You could put a wood stove in there. You could put a gas heater. And um, if you wanted to do that, I'd recommend um, putting like a double walled uh, plastic on there so that you can create like an air pocket in between and that acts like a, I think it brings you up like a, maybe another seven or eight um, gives you another seven or eight degrees of um, insulation value for freezing and stuff and that, it keeps your heat in better but and so it's almost you know not quite as good as a greenhouse but it would definitely extend your season you know, probably another month on either end. By then you want to take a break anyway, it's Christmas time. <laughs> but um, yeah, and then when you have the ends open, do you get any, um, I guess it would be any animals uh, munching on your plants? Well, like um, I had deer and turkeys get in mine. I had a grouse fly right through it. He went right through the side of the plastic and fell on the inside and he was dead. So I just, I was like, wow, couldn't believe he hit that thing like that. But, but, um, and then I had a last, not last winter, but the winter before I had a coyote climb all the way up on the top of the high tunnel because the snow drifted over it. And I didn't realize it was getting that deep. So I went out there to inspect it. And I had to hurry up and get a roof rake because you have to have a special roof rake to remove the snow. You don't want to scratch the plastic and rip it. So there's these, these snow rakes that kind of, they're called avalanche and you slide them underneath the snow. They got like little rollers on them and then the snow will slide off. So I had to hurry up and get one of those because it was at like, I had it up for like nine years, never had to remove snow off at one time. And then that winter, somehow it like, ice storm froze on the plastic and then the snow stuck to it anyways it got so deep that a, coyote, a coyote climbed all the way up on the top and i could see his tracks on the plastic where he'd been walking around on there it was crazy but yeah they they can withstand a lot quite a bit of weight but you do want to keep an eye on them and i definitely recommend getting the uh, gothic style or or research what you know, like maybe there's some latest, um, I know some companies have more bracing in them too, but you want the, the rounded, you don't want the flat garage roof type one. I know a guy that got one of those and it caved right in. So you want the, the rounder with the Gothic peak on it, and then that'll shed the snow a lot better. 
and then you don't want to put it like right by some big trees where it'll act like a snow fence either that wouldn't be good but we we can help you pick pick out the good location for it too you know so and uh, Jamie had a good question, wondering about if band members or participants who uh, live out of state or out of Minnesota, would they contact their local NRCS office if they were interested in a high tunnel or the EQIP program? Yeah, it would probably be best. Um, I did help a band member out that lived in Wisconsin, just helped him make some connections with uh, a local guy over there. and. And you know they they have their own funding pool, so we can't spend money from Minnesota into Wisconsin, but we can definitely help you with uh, you know find out who you should be in contact with, and then make sure that you identify as American Indian because it'll help move you up on the list. Sometimes there's a long waiting list to get high tunnels, so that would help you. You don't have to be enrolled; you just have to be affiliated, and you'd be fine. Thank you. And yeah, that's all the questions I see right now. Okay. So um, along with the healthy soil, we try to promote um, as much pollination as we can on the farm. And I've always kind of, you know, loved insects and all that stuff. So we started out a few years back with just two hives. And now I think we're up to 15 and we started marketing some of our honey. And, um, you know, there's a little bit of a learning curve, but there's a lot of good information out there about beekeeping. And I think it makes sense to, you know, try to promote as many pollinators as you can to um, help with the crops. And we have quite a few apple trees, so that's helped out a lot with those. And I actually think they might be collecting pollen off the wild rice too, because when I was out ricing, I seen some of my bees out there. I noticed, you know, I can kind of recognize the little abdomen part on them or whatever. <laughs> And I noticed some of them out there on the lake, and I, I'm pretty sure it was the, those ones, you know. So they probably collect and pollen from there. And then uh, I also really like the basswood honey, and we have a lot of um, basswood trees, you know, in, around the area here. So it's kind of amazing when you when you learn about the bees, like all the different things that they feed on during the different times of the year. We did a little experiment. Um, Oh, there I was talking about wild rice. That's my old brother Lou and I rice. And, and um, that's part of our family farm too. That was kind of like probably our first family business based on agriculture. You know, was our, my dad would always, um, he would always sell rice and, um, you know, he'd purchase rice off the lake and then finish it. I always remember like there was constantly a parcher going at around fall time at home my grandma she would tell stories about um you know she lived on the shore of, of perch lake her whole life and then her relatives um even before the reservation were formed they they lived on indian point on perch lake and she would tell stories about when they would put the rice on the on the old birch bark um tarp they would make like tarps out of birch bark like a thing to hold the rice on and dry it and she always would say oh it's a it's a it's a team effort you know the people that would rice would go get rice and then they'd be people on shore drying it and then he'd be people with several kettles parching it and now you think about today we you know a lot of people just harvest it and they sell it right away but our, one of our traditions is the first harvest of the year we always take it through that whole process by hand and then we uh, have a feast at the end and offer up a offering for the for the harvest but i think it's important to learn how to do them small batches just i was thinking about that during the covid thing and everything like how would a lot of people survive if they didn't even really know how to do stuff anymore you know like you might know how to harvest rice, but if you don't know, that's just a small part of it, you know. And, and the whole family farm thing is, um, I think the reason why we like to do it is because half of the half of it is just the teaching of it and passing the um, traditions down. And you know what could be better than than good fresh wild rice that comes out of a hand parched kettle? I mean, there's nothing like it, 
nothing. I mean, the smell of it and the, and the taste of it, there's hardly too much that compares to the, the quality of it. You just don't get it from machines and it just doesn't taste the same, I don't think. I mean, it's good, but. Um, and then we do, we started doing a little bit of maple syrup now. We're, we're just small scale, but that's um, something that I've, that I've always done my whole life, you know, and it's an exciting time of year because spring is, everyone's waiting for spring and finally it warms up and it's just, it's awesome. And, the, and like I was saying, the smell of the wild rice parch and I think equally the smell of the sap cooking is amazing. And little kids, they just get so excited about, you know, imagining that the syrup's coming out of the trees and, and all that. And then they taste it and, you know, the fruits of the labor of being out there doing all that work. And it's, I don't know, I just, it wouldn't seem like spring if I didn't tap at least a few, you know. But um, I think we'd like to grow that part of our business a little more. Um, but we still like to do small batches because it just seems like it's, you know, the quality of it stays really nice. Um, we, 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 like, like I've been kind of lecturing on here, you know, a lot of diverse products. Um, a couple of years back, we, I met this guy and he was talking about doing hemp um, for like, medicinal purposes and things like that so we so we got a license through the state and we built um we had a large part of our field that we weren't really utilizing too much and so we i purchased this machine to lay like a fabric and we did we did like a seven year um fabric in there and with drip line irrigation and then we started growing the hemp and we were able to grow enough hemp for all, you know, we were thinking about just growing hemp and selling the hemp, but then we started looking into it and kind of coming up with our own label on it because there wasn't a whole lot of money in it. And it was like, you know, I felt kind of like John Henry trying to keep up with the steam engine or something because a lot of these guys started growing the hemp with, you know, like large scale cornfield type hemp and all that. And so I, I tried to stay like, like, you know, so we stayed organic and tried to fit like a niche market with it. And that's worked out pretty good for us. We've been able to partner with um, some of the processors to take our oil and we get our own oil back that's made into different products. But it's been kind of a learning curve, you know, trying to figure out all the third party testing. And I mean, there's kind of a lot to it, um, but it's been kind of fun and trying to market it and all that stuff. And now we have it in the Whole Food Co-ops in Duluth and in Cloquet. And then um, we're marketing some of our stuff with Intertribal Ag now too. So that's like a organization that helps native producers and, and tribes to market their products and technical support and all that different stuff. So you can Google that up. That's another good resource for native farmers to network with. But it was a lot of work. We built a deer fence all around it. And we kind of did all this stuff just in one spring. And I hired a um hired some relatives and some tribal members. And we got and there was a few youth that came out and helped. And so it was it was a good experience. And it's kind of um really helped us with, with um diversifying our farm a little more. So this is the hemp here on the left. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so the seven-year weed mat, what does that mean? What is that? Oh, it's a breathable um, weed barrier. So it lets water and air through it. It's not plastic. It's not like a plastic, you know, like bag type. You see some of that mulch that it's plastic and then you have to tear it up every year or two or whatever. Well, this stuff is like, it has like breathable holes in it. So when it rains, the water runs through and then the air can filtrate back and forth through it. 
And so you can see the hemp on the left um, growing through that. And then we planted um, buckwheat in between all the rows, that light colored green is the buckwheat. And so that was really good for the pollinators. The bees love buckwheat and they make like a real dark honey out of that. And then we did um, like a wildflower pollinator. Um, and then we did some clover, like short growing clover in between the rows too. And one of the better cover crops I found, if anyone's interested, is, um, is the rye grass is really good because it, it has a um, weed inhibitor naturally in its root sources and it actually inhibits the growth of other plants. So once you plant it, um, it'll kind of like take over and get rid of some of the weeds and different things that you don't want there. And then when you till it into the soil, you don't want to plant into it for a while because that inhibitor sticks around for, you know, weeks or month, maybe a month. So I did um, some experiments because we did have like tansy and a few other things that we didn't want taken over on the farm. So I planted, um, I did like a light tillage with not like a tiller, but like with a with a, an implement that just kind of scarifies the surface of the soil. And then I planted the rye in there and it was, really good at choking out all the rest of the plants and then we were able to plant you know some pollinator habitat in there after that that worked out pretty good so we weren't you know we didn't have to spray like herbicides or any of that stuff on it when did you plant the rye what season um, we did i did a winter one once and that worked out well like a late fall and then we did it in the early spring and it did well then too it's it's a it's a pretty, uh, you know, it's not that hard to grow. And it does a really nice job of um, out competing a lot of the other, a lot of the weed species and things like that. So yeah, the bees were super happy. They were just everywhere in between the hemp. And then I called one guy and he said, oh, you don't want bees. You don't want pollinators around your hemp. He's like, if it gets seeds, if it get you know because you want to have all female plants well we did find like seven male plants but we we found them before they were um, mature enough to make seed with the female plants so thank thankful about that because that could have destroyed everything but um so anyway this guy got me all nerved out about the bees and i was like ah the bees aren't gonna hurt you know i mean whatever he was saying that the bees were going to pollinate, get the pollen from the, if there's any male plants and pollinate all the, all the hemp and stuff, but it was all, all right. It all worked out good. So, so anyways, um, there's always something to learn though. I went out there one day and the hemp had all these like hornworms on it. And I was like, oh my God, what do I do now? I don't want to spray, you know, poison on the hemp, you know, make it like, non-organic and everything so so i did a little research and there was this um natural biological stuff called bt bursillus i can't remember the last part but anyways if you go to your local uh like feed store or whatever where you get your seeds and stuff they'll probably have it it's a, you just refer to it as bt but it's all natural so anyway we sprayed that on there and it gives it the worms eat it and then they um can't digest the plant anymore and they they die or whatever it sounds kind of bad but at least they didn't eat the plants so then we also released these lace wing um flies to eat the because we had these aphids trying to get the plants. If the plants are really healthy, everything wants to get them, you know? So, um, so we released, released the lace swings and we released a bunch of ladybugs, the Native American ladybugs, not the Asian ones. And those little suckers, man, I was watching them out there. I was, I was just like spying on them, you know? And they were just eating those aphids like you wouldn't believe. And like two weeks later, we had zero aphids. So that was pretty cool too. And we had a massive hemp harvest. Oh my God. I was like 
what are we gonna do with all this stuff? We had to cut it all and dry it, and uh, we had to we had to fix the shed up because you got to dry it where it's not in the sunlight. It's kind of like drying tobacco or something. So yeah, it was a heck of an undertaking. Thank God I I was able to get people to help because we, you know, we hired people to help and we just hung it all up in there and we had to like rotate it out because it it was a big lot of stuff, but. So anyway, we kind of scaled it back a little bit. We're only growing enough hemp now for what we need for our products. That was kind of a learning curve. I should have did the nine steps of planning on that one a little better. <laughs> but um, these are some of our products that we carry. Um, you know, like I said, it's all organic. We Like for our gummies, they got, um, instead of regular sweetener, they got... Um, maple syrup for a sweetener and and then there's several different kinds of tea um, we seem to be a little more specializing in like the like the um, topical ointments and things like that those seem to be our best sellers um, and then we we got some pet treats now too those have been a pretty big hit um, so they calm pets down and all that stuff um and then we've been doing a little bit of value added stuff and trying to trying to um i guess advance our label and like stay tr stay true to our you know trying to be organic and all that stuff so we're we're trying to do like biodegradable now we got biodegradable rice bags for our, our one pound rice bag so they're the bag's actually made out of rice and is biodegradable. And then my wife's been experimenting with candles and uh, just trying to like do some cooler bottling, you know, to set ourselves apart a little bit from some of the some of the um, other products that are out there. So yeah, it's been a it's been a learning curve. If anyone ever wants to visit or anything. Um, you know, feel free to contact me and I'll try to help you through some of the, some of the, uh, maybe you won't make some of the mistakes we made, but yeah, it's been, it's been kind of fun. You know, I haven't been doing a lot of fishing lately, but my wife loves all this farming stuff. So I guess our latest thing is we're, um, we're moving to uh, my uncle's old farm. We're going to do a, we're looking to do like a beef or bison ranch out there. So there's quite a bit of acres that were like hay fields and all that. And so we're going to, we're going to slowly try to get a rotational grazing system going where we can uh, build up a herd of animals and then have, um, you know, organic bison or beef available. And I don't know if anyone has any more questions at this point. Yes, and thank you for all of that. It's so exciting, everything you're doing, and to hear that Buffalo might be on the horizon. That's great. Um, yeah. Okay, quick question. Someone was wondering about the cost of high tunnels. Um, well, it, the way the way our program works is we um, and they pay so much per square foot, and so I think for like when I got mine, I think the the payment rate back then was like 5,000 that you'd get for, that would be the most you'd get. And I think you had to put one up that was like 30 by 70 in order to get that, that amount of funding. You could put up a bigger one, but you just wouldn't get more funding. And if you put up a smaller one, you'd get less because of the square footage. But I'm pretty sure now we're up to like 10,000 for that same size. So it's almost doubled. But then of course the price of the everything's gone up. So it's it's based on the square footage. Um is the best I could tell you. And so if you put up a smaller one, you'll you'll get less money, but it'll cost less. It should basically cut pay for almost the cost of all the materials. And we used to have this program, it was, it was a cost share. So we'd have a certain percentage. So if the high tunnel costs 
10,000, we'd probably pay nine or something because, you know, it was a percentage, but they went away from that whole program. So now it's just the straight payment rate. So we could figure it out based on the size you want to do. Um, one of the requirements is you need to have a current garden right there. And then if you want um, to apply for micro irrigation, you have to have been watering the garden for at least two years and you have to have an in inadequate system and then you know then you'd qualify to apply for funding um any other questions yeah um where do you get the bio biodegradable bags for packaging um any other alternatives to plastic um we've been working with like print pro my wife kind of handles all that i'm i'm the farmer guy but she did some research there was some company in china and then she couldn't get them from there we didn't really want to you know we'd rather buy them from the u.s but i think it's a company in georgia or somewhere that she ended up getting in bags but you had to buy a huge quantity of them so you want to make sure you got everything right before you buy them because they have to set up a press to print everything on it and stuff so it's uh but i could get the information for anyone if they wanted to send me an email or something um so yeah we're trying to do we're working we're working on doing some workshops with uh youth from the inner city of duluth this summer so we're going to try to get them out there and have them learn a little bit about the business and and also some you know we're taking them on some field trips maybe mix in some um, adventure education type outings with them too and then one of our favorite things is we like cooking with um with all of our veggies and you know different products that we get so so i think that's another thing that we'd like to do is um you know maybe like do some little workshops on that in the future. And I think that's the end. Yeah, I have a few more questions. So, um, okay, looks like, oh, oh, sorry, that's my dog. One second, Jamie, could you, could I hand off to you for a sec? <laughs> this is Sid's question. Okay, Dave, we had a couple more questions. Um, I'm just gonna go back up here. Okay, so you said that you have to do a lot of soil preparation. Do you have different soil preparation for different plants? And what soil species do you have on your farm? What's the soil like on your farm? Um, um, we have like a loamy, we have like a, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, we have like a loamy sand. Well, there's different types of soil. Um, there's some spots on the farm that are a little bit sandier than others. Um, and then just down the road where we're going to do the bison, that's a little heavier soil over there. It's got a little more clay in it. So I would recommend, um, you know, there's the, there's a lot of information on the internet. You, you, um, if you went on the National Soil Survey website, you could look up your own property and find out what kind of soil you got. It'll give you a real good general idea. But then I would probably recommend doing a soil test by taking um, random samples all around your plot and then send them in through the county extension. And that would really give you a good idea of where you're at. And then um, the more you can keep healthy, like living roots in the soil, um that really builds the soil you know anytime you disturb the soil web we call it by busting up all the soil a lot of people want to till and till and till it's okay to till once in a while but you're you're really um setting yourself back because of all that um living um biomass all those roots in the soil all those different chemical reactions that are going on at the molecular level in the soil all get disturbed every time you bust it you know you try to tail if you try to tail it up constantly you're, you're actually depleting 
a lot of the carbon and a lot of the um, nutrients out of the soil. So, so you wanna do that as little as possible. And I think cover crops are a really good way to get around that. And if you plant them at the right time of the year, you can actually um, lightly disc or, um, you know, if you just disturb the surface of the soil once in a while, that's not a big deal. You know, it's good, actually good. But the more you can mulch it um, and, and compost it, you know, that could be, a, I think that should be everyone's long-term goal. And you're not just going to start out doing that, you know, you're going to have weed issues and different things, but over a long period of time, um, if you do the right things, you can really become, uh, have a no-till and very little inputs into the soil. The soil will take care of itself if you, um, you know, nurture it in a good way and not disturb it too much. The last thing you want to do is constantly till it up and plow it up and, you know, beat it up. I mean, it just, over time, the soil will lose a lot of its potential and they're finding that out. Um, I actually could, um, if you're ever interested, I could have a soil, we have soil scientists that work for us and they know a lot more than I do about the soil, you know, about that end of it. But we have a rainfall simulator machine that simulates like, um, disturbed soil versus non-disturbed and then also um, there's like different um, little demonstrations that we could do that that would really um, be kind of a hands-on experiment if people are interested and that is a topic for one of these times we could, I could you know I could uh, set something like that up if, if there's an interest And so, yeah, I would definitely look into um, figuring out where you're at. Um, just a basic rule of thumb on soil, the sandier the soil, the worse news you got, because a lot of your nutrients will leach out of that. And, and if you look, if you think of the surface of, of sand, you know, there's not as much surface area on there as there is on clay. So clay, I mean, you wouldn't want solid clay in your garden, but the heavier soils, they hold more um, surface area. And so when you build that soil up, your nutrients aren't leaching out of it all the time. So yeah, it's, it's important to know what soil type you got. And then that can really um, govern the way that you would want to, what kind of management you'd want to do to, to optimize your, you know, your growing on that soil. So anyone that's interested, just let me know. And there are, you know, if you want a soil, I had a soil scientist come in before, um, and I think present at Giddy Gun, but and we could have them do like specific stuff too. You know, like sometimes they get a little. I mean, I get carried away too, but they get a little more carried away. So we could have them talk specifically about like the main soil type on the reservation or whatever, and how would you build that soil up, or you know kind of narrow their focus down a little bit. So yeah, if you wanna, if you want me to set something like that up, just let me know. Thank you. Yeah, a couple more questions here. Um, okay, so Deb asks us, hemp is a controlled product. Are there seed sellers only available if you have a license in the state of Minnesota? Are, did I read that right? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, the license comes to the state and you can buy your seeds from anywhere, but your seeds have to be um, approved prior to uh, purchasing them. So you have to send them the genetic information about the seeds and then you can, then you can um, be approved to grow them. Uh-oh, I think my battery's getting low. <laughs> well, we're getting close to the end, so. We'll just have you as long as we have you, I suppose. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, does the hemp have to be tested to ensure no THC? So I know you no. mentioned some of that test, third party testing. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely has to be tested. Um, they come out to your field and they test, they take clippings, they clip all your big buds. No, I'm just kidding. They clip like 20 of buds and they take them and they test them and then, um, if they're over, if they get too much THC, they'll actually make you destroy your crop. So ours has always been pretty good, but I try to get my test as early as possible. 
So, but you got to get on their list. Yeah. It's kind of a, you got to get background checked and, you know, all that good stuff, but it's kind of a cool crop to grow. I, you know, a lot of our products are zero THC. And so, you know, we're trying to, we're not trying to sell the head shops or none of that stuff. You know, we're trying to like, create a healthy product that's organic you know so that's kind of our goal i'm gonna grab i'm gonna see if i can grab the charger cord quick oh you got the charger okay, so uh, while that's happening um i wanted to quick share about classes on thursdays so you all can see that um so these this has been a great series through the uh, bamaji Dewin uh producer program um, through the Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College Extension Program, right, Erica? <laughs> um, and so it looks like uh, this Thursday, there's uh, Growing Soil with Francois, um, who many of you may know. Uh, so more on soil for those that are interested. Um, Erica, anything you wanted to add? Uh, no, just um, email me if you, so I can send you the Zoom link for this coming Thursday as the last class for April. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. Okay. And then are you all? Oh, Caitlin, yeah. um, <laughs> were, were you going to mention about summer Gitagon classes? Hold on. Um, I suppose I could. Um, do you want to pull up that information, the poster and stuff? I did not have that prepped um, while I have Dave answer one more question. <laughs> Or maybe Aria won't let you, but okay. Well, I'll try to pull that up too. All right, so Gail's wondering about um, an organic product that works on spotted wing drosophila in raspberries. Mm. Um, boy, I'm not, I'm not really too sure on that one. Um, I know who would know though that, um, What's that guy? He's with the extension service. He knows all about that stuff. Uh, Bob Olin. He used to come into Giddy Gone and talk quite a bit, but I haven't had a whole lot of trouble with my raspberries. So I'm kind of a guy that, you know, I like to learn as much as I can, but I usually don't figure anything out until after I already have a problem and I have to research it. But so I'm not sure, but I would say extension service might be a good, good one to talk to about that. And it could be quite a few different factors, but there's probably a good solution to it. And they, they would be the ones to talk to about that, I would think. Okay, thanks, Jamie. So yeah, she put in some information in the chat. Um, we'll also have more information about summer get on classes in the newspaper and put it on um, Facebook and Instagram too. If you're not following us, we're um, at FBL Gitagon. Um, oh, and then the poster will be on the Fond du Lac website tomorrow. So that's just fblres.com. So that'll have the registration link and all the details because it'll be a little different format than we have been doing for the spring series. Um, yeah. I don't think there's any more questions unless someone else wants to chime in. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask if you have anything. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hi, it's Sam. Um, Dave, is there, what's the best email to use to contact you? Was that for me or? Yep. Oh, dave.wise at usda.gov. Big witch. Yep. How are we doing on time? Pretty good, or did I get done? A couple minutes soon? left. I think we covered everything. And yeah, everyone be sure to mark your calendars for the annual Get a Gone Plant and Seed giveaway. That's on Saturday, June 5th this year in the same spot, the Resource Management Garage. And it'll be 8 a.m. to noon. Um, but I know, I'm guessing we'll have a busy year again like we did last year. And I think we ran out of plants at like 9.30. So be sure to show up early. And it's open to all uh, tribal citizens. <laughs> um, and then uh, I think it's 
was it attend three classes and then you're eligible um, if uh, you aren't enrolled. Um, okay, I think that's it. Anything else Where's you wanted the... to add, Dave? <laughs> what was that? Oh, Sam, are you chiming in again? Yeah, I just wanted to ask real quick, where was the Steve giveaway? It's the resource management garage. So like right across from the Head Start where those food boxes have been. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Very yeah. Good. You're welcome. Well, I'd just like to say miigwetch for having me be a presenter. It was an honor to come and talk to all of you and a happy, happy spring and happy gardening. Gosh, Dave, thanks so much for sharing your expertise and all your experience. Um, so appreciate everything you're doing. So thanks for being here. Mm -hmm. Miigwech everyone for attending. It's so good to see you all. Thanks, Dave. Yep. Thanks, Greg. <laughs> yeah, everyone. Yeah, this is like the first time we've ended on time in a while. So good work, everybody. <laughs> I'm like the rain man. <laughs> <laughs> when you were like, yeah, worried about not having enough time, but it's like the hour is just a perfect amount of time for what you did. So, we're good. Huh. Okay, All right, we'll see you guys.